Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends. This is Raymond, your host. Welcome again to the Inner Sanctum. Come in, won't you? You'll have to excuse me for not getting up, but I have an awfully stiff neck. You see, I was out with a certain lady last night who collects very curious things. She spent the first half of the evening telling me how wonderful I am, but after that... Well, it's one thing when a girl tries to turn your head. It's another when she tries to twist it off. <laughs> and now, friends, let me introduce someone who is a real lady. She must be a lady because she wants to reform me. Uh, come in, Mary Bennett. Hello, folks. Drop a coffin and sit down, Mary. Now, Mr. Raymond, please don't talk that way. It is nice. Why are you always pretending to be so cold-hearted and creepy? Underneath, I'm sure you're a friendly, good-natured sort of man. <laughs> yes, you are. Underneath, you're just like everybody else. I'll bet you like to come home in the evening, put on an old jacket and slippers, and then sit down to supper. Yes, sir, and I'll bet I know one of your favorite dishes, too. Noodle soup. Or well, most all men like noodle soup. That's why Lipton's is so popular. Lipton's noodle soup is real homemade tasting. It's got a grand chickeny flavor, and it's swimming with noodles. Egg noodles, too. You know, Lipton's noodle soup will bring a family swarming to the table quicker than a dinner bell. Mr. Raymond, someday I'm going to take you home with me and feed you a good hot bowl of Lipton's noodle soup. Oh, well, thanks for the invitation, Mary. And uh, now let me invite you to come to the desert and hear the story of Desert Death. It's an original tale written by that spinner of surprise stories, Robert Newman. And our star tonight is Horace Braham. A desert, eerie and mysterious at sundown. The sun sinking slowly in a purple haze. The cactus casting long and weirdly twisting shadows. The hot wind still. The silence overall. Driving fast, a dusty car comes down a narrow desert road. At the wheel is Dan Darrell, a rancher. Next to him is his Indian friend, Toby Priest. <laughs> Still worrying, Toby? Stop teasing me, Dan. You know I never did worry. I just told you what my people used to think it meant. Used to think? Didn't you say we ought to postpone our trip into town today? I did. And when did you say it? Right after you saw them, three vultures lying together toward the sunset. That means three days. A bad omen for a journey. <laughs> hey, look. I see him. What's a man doing out here in the middle of nowhere on foot? Anything the matter, stranger? Need no help? You are very kind. Our car broke down and... Well, we were in a bit of a spot. Didn't know whether anyone would be likely to come along here or not. I... We? Oh, I, I didn't see your friends. Well, come in. We're going to Palo Verde. We're glad to take you that far. Well, that's very decent of you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my name is Darrell, Dan Darrell, and this is Toby Priest. And I'm very happy to know you. I'm Richards, and this is Brennan and Smith. How do you do? Howdy. Uh, you're British, ain't you? Why, yes. <laughs> Clever of you to spot it. We're on our way out to the coast. One of those hush-hush missions. That's why it's so important we get into town. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, which way'd you come? Medicine Creek or Route 12? Why, uh, uh Medicine Creek. It sounded more scenic. You're lying, Dan. You know that, don't you? What makes you see that? Toby. Use your head. He doesn't look. Mr. Darrow, surely it's considered rude to whisper in front of strangers, even here in America, isn't it? Huh? 
Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, I'm sure you will be. But first, I must insist on knowing what you were saying. Insist? What do you mean, insist? This is my car, and this is a... I know. A free country. But this is a gun. That's why I can insist. And now, will you tell me what you were saying? I was saying it, so I'll tell you. I said you were lying, that you weren't British at all. No? But then who are we? I think that you're Nazi prisoners who escaped from that camp up near Post City. Oh? Uh, and what makes you think that? First, none of your clothes fit you, so they're obviously not yours. Second, you said your car broke down, but there wasn't any car around. Third, you said you came by way of Medicine Creek, and that road's closed. All right. Stop the car and let us get it over with. You mean shoot them? Uh, not so quick, then. We can use them for a while, yes? At least one of them. What the devil do you mean? Of course, your Indian friend is right. Very clever, too. But since I have a gun, you will take orders from me. Our first need is water. You have any in the car? No. And then we will have to find some. Yeah? Where'd you expect to find water in the desert? I told you we were Nazis, Darrow. I did not tell you that we were Ronald's men from the Africa Corps. That means we know the desert, any desert, better than anyone on Earth. Those hills off there to the left, take the left-hand road at that fork there and head toward them. But do as I say. How much further you want me to go up this... this wagon track? Slow up. Isn't that a... Yes. The shack right next to the cliff. Stop. Ah, looks deserted, but... There, next to it. Is that not a well? It should be. Renner, go see if there's any water in it. Double haircut. You two come with us. We'll go look at the shack. What is this place? Those terraces up there on the cliff? A pueblo. Cliff dwellings. Centuries ago, my people lived in villages like this. There is water in it, Herr Colonel. Even a bucket to get it up with. Good. Come into the house. Match, Schmidt. Hmm. From the dust, I'd say no one had been here for a good many years. Prospector's cabin, wasn't it? Probably. That means... Ah, that's what I want. Shovel. What do you want that for? Want to dig yourself a grave? Yes, Darren, exactly. But not for me. Huh? What do you mean? Precisely what I said. Sit down. Make yourselves comfortable and I will explain things to you. I'll stand if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. We Nazis are very objective, analytical people... We decided we needed a car to make our escape in. Now we have one. We also decided we needed someone to drive the car and get us safely across the border. That means we can use one of you. The other one will die. You... you wouldn't dare. My dear Darrow, outside of the thousands of men we killed in North Africa who don't count, we killed at least two guards in making our escape. Do you really think one more death means anything to us. The only question is, which of you shall die? This one here. He talks too much. Well, that's not quite fair, Brenner. He's just, shall we say, less stoical than the Indian. On the other hand, I think that in the long run, he would probably prove easier to handle, less dangerous. That means that the Indian dies. What? Why, you... Shut up, Joe! Uh, <coughs> thank you, Brenner. Schmidt. Take the gun, the shovel, and our Indian friend, yeah. and watch over him while he digs his grave. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Of course, I personally would prefer a deeper grave, but that's up to you. The depth is not important. The only thing that matters is that it faces west. That is why I dug it with the head against the cliff. An old tribal custom. Very interesting. Similar to the Egyptians. But of course, they believed in a life after death. My people believe in a life after death also, Colonel. 
And in this case, I think I can promise that I will not rest easy in my grave. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hear this, too, men from across the seas. Men with death in your hearts. For the evil you would do, evil will follow you like a hungry wolf. What is that? Not he just mentioned. A wolf? Though you bury me deep, the earth will not hide me till you have paid for your crimes. Here where you have killed, here too will you die. Now, Herr Colonel. Yes, Brenner. Oh, you can't, you. Oh. Very good, Schmidt. I'll take the gun now. Fill in the grave, then meet us back at the cabin. Place. It's within Quatara. I wish you'd sit down, Darrell, and stop staring out of the window. You're worried about your friend. I buried him very nicely. I'm not worried about him. I'm thinking about what he said before you killed him. I should think that you think about it, too. That? <laughs> we have had more curses laid on us in more languages than you have hairs on your head. What's that? Must be the wind. No. No, it is different. More like some kind of musical instrument. But there's no one around here but us. There hasn't been anyone living in those houses up on the cliff for centuries. It's just the wind, I tell you. But if you want to, go take a look. Go take a look, I said. Yeah, I will, Herr It's too dark. There's too much sand blowing to see anything. But wait. Go there near the foot of the cliff. There's something. It looks like... Evil God! It's the Indian! He's lying there! Out of his grave! Oh, you bury me deep. The earth will not hide me. Till you are paid for your crimes. Here where you are killed. Here too. Will you die? <laughs> <laughs> a hundred curses in a dozen different tongues. Perhaps they did mean three deaths. If so, who are the others that'll die and who'll live? Gosh, Mr. Raymond, this is exciting. What? Oh, Mary Bennett, I've overlooked you in all this desert. Uh, tell me, Mary, whom do you hope will die, huh? Well, I don't like to see anybody killed. But those Nazis sure ought to be clapped in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, deprived of their Lipton's noodle soup, aren't they? Well, I should say. Lipton's noodle soup is much too good for fellas like them. It belongs to law-abiding folks who've got a right to sit down to a plate of homemade tasting soup. And say, that's just the kind of noodle soup you get when you use Lipton. Lipton's is the noodle soup with the old-fashioned flavor, you know, brimming with noodles and blessed with a real chickeny taste. Yes, it takes Lipton's to show how good a noodle soup can be. Now, but... Mary, don't get so excited. Stay calm. Uh, why don't you go and perch on that tombstone over there while I go on with the story of death in the desert? I'm warning you, if I do go on, you'll be seeing strange sights and hearing strange sounds every time you put out the lights. But it's your funeral. It's uh, just a moment later now. The three Nazis are still standing at the open door of the deserted cabin, staring out into the darkness. And the colonel turns sharply, glares at death. What was that you said, Darren? I was just repeating what Tova said. Oh, you murdered him. It's, it's true, Herr Colonel. That's what he did say. The earth will not hide me. And there he is out of his grave, lying there. Shut up. Him. Fine Nazi you are. A fine example of the Africa Corps. Listening to the ravings of a savage and believing them. Schmidt, where did you bury the Indian? In the sand. Then this wind came along and blew the sand away. And that's all. And, and that strange means... Another trick of the wind. But if it bothers you to see him lying there, go on out and bury him again. Deeper this time. No, Herr Colonel, no. Well, that's an order. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. Mein Schmidt seems to be getting a bit uh, rattled. That's why I sent him out there. 
Nothing like facing a fear to overcome it. Colonel Ulrich, do you not think it is about time that Schmidt came back? Hmm. He's only been gone about five or ten minutes. I told him to dig the grave deep this time. I know, but uh, I do not see him out there anywhere. Well, how could you expect to when it's so dark and when the sand is blowing like that? Maybe we'd better go out and see what's taking him so long. And uh, you too, Mr. Darrell, if you don't mind. Not at all. Schmidt! Schmidt, where are you? Last last idiot probably wandered off into the desert. Schmidt! Oh, look, the Indian... He's still lying there. He never did bury him. That means Schmidt never even got over there. Must have lost his way right after he got outside. Schmidt! I think you can save your breath, Colonel Ulrich. Right over here. To the well. Huh? What are you talking about? Schmidt. Dead. Well, why are you looking at me like that, Brenner? Exactly. As I said, he lost his way in the darkness, the sandstorm, fell down the well. Yeah. Yeah, I... I guess that is what must have happened. As for you, Mr. Darrell, since you discovered Schmidt, you shall have the pleasure of burying your friend the Indian again. Yeah, oh, dear Colonel. I'm sorry, I never did appreciate the American type of humor. Now get busy with that show. Yeah, I... Just point out that while it's easy for you to knock me down when my hands are tied, it's not so easy for me to use a shovel. Oh, I intend to untie you. But please remember always that I have a gun and that Brenner and I have every intention of getting away from here. I'm happy to see that you've stopped pacing the floor and looking out the window, Mr. Darrell. That means you've stopped expecting something miraculous to happen that will save you. Is that what you think it means? Frankly, no. In fact, I think just the opposite. You're looking much more cheerful than before. You're thinking one of them is dead. Now it'll be that much easier to get away. It really pains me to disillusion you. Schmidt was a sergeant. A fool. I can assure you that neither Brenner nor myself are going to be bothered by strange noises or tricks of the wind. Right, Brenner? Of course not, Colonel. Good. And now, if we are to make an early start, I think we should get some rest. Brenner, you take the first watch and wake me at midnight. I advise you to get some rest, too, Darrell. <laughs> Maybe you'll be able to dream of some way of escaping. Thanks. But I'm not sleeping. As you wish. Good night. What a character. He was one of the best soldiers in the Africa Corps. Yeah? Where's Africa Corps now? Where are you? This isn't Africa, Brenner. This is America. This is a part of America where strange things happen. Things that even the Indians can't explain. Indians. <laughs> Ignorant savages. The devilish music again. Where does it come from? I thought you said it was a wind. Or was it always to say that? It must be the wind. It must. Oh, you bury me deep. The earth will not hide me till you pay for your crimes. What is that? That was what Tova said just before you killed him. Schmidt was first, Brenner. You will be next. I'm waiting, Brenner. Waiting. You. Waiting. You heard that, Tova? Yeah. I heard it. You're lying. You're lying, I say. You, you're, you're, you're just trying to frighten me. Oh, what? Who, who's trying to frighten you? What's going on? It, uh, it is nothing here, Colonel. Just that, that music again. And for a moment, it sounded as if someone was calling my name. Someone was calling your name, Brenner. The dead man. You know you heard it. So? There it is again. You hear it? Just that same noise, the wind. Look, Woolwich, look. That Indian, 
He's out of his grave again. How can you tell? It's too dark to see. But I know he is. I know it. I, 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 I'm very disappointed in you, Brenner. You're losing your grip. Slipping. I... Sorry, Herr Colonel. It, it's... It is just this place, the nervous tension, the mating. Just being sorry isn't enough. Fear is a weakness. As much of a weakness as pity. You know that as Nazis, we cannot tolerate either one. And you also know what you must do, don't you? No. No, Herr Colonel. No. You must face your fear and overcome it. You must go out there and prove to yourself that you are not afraid. That you've just been imagining things the way Schmidt did. But, but Schmidt... Schmidt was a fool. And he had an accident. You are an officer. And you will not have an accident. Now go ahead and convince yourself that this is all nonsense. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. But leave the gun with me. What's out there is imaginary, but Mr. Darrell is very real. If I didn't have a gun, he might get ideas. Jawohl, Herr Colonel. Here. I shall be back in a few minutes. You're looking at me very strangely, Mr. Darrell. Perhaps now you're starting to understand the fiber of the Nazi character. And perhaps now you're beginning to realize why you can never win this war. Because we allow nothing to defeat us or stand in our way. Any sign of weakness is ruthlessly stamped out. And... Abel, God, what's that? Sounded to me like Brenner. Outside, quick. And don't try to get away or I'll shoot you down in your tracks. Okay. Which way? Towards the cliff where we buried the Indian. That's where he went and... What's that over there? My guess is that it's your friend, Brenner. Maybe you better make sure. It... It is Brenner. Dead. Strangled. So it was all imagination, huh? Just face your fear and overcome it. Aren't you feeling just a little frightened, Colonel? Yeah. No. There's some rational explanation for everything that happened. Look. The Indian. He is out of his grave again. And that's the answer. He wasn't dead. But this should take care of him. There. And you will notice that even at a moment like this, I look ahead. One shot before and four now. That still leaves one bullet for you, if it should prove necessary. You think of everything, don't you? Yes, my friend, everything. Now get into that car. We're not going to wait until morning. We're leaving here right now. I thought you had everything figured out. You weren't frightened. What's that? What's what? That, that noise, that, that music. It's, it's like the music we heard after we killed the Indian. I don't hear anything. Oh, but you, you must hear it. You must. Listen. It's coming from over there. For the evil you have done, evil will follow you like a hungry wolf. Though you bury me deep, the earth will not hide me till you have paid for your crimes. Did... Did you hear that? Did you hear it? Yeah. I heard it. Here where you have killed here, too, will you die? No. No. You're dead. You're dead, I tell you. I killed you. First Schmidt. Then Brenner. Now you. But you're dead, I tell you. And the dead don't speak. I can't be really hearing you unless... Mad. No. I can't let that happen. I can't. There's one way... The Nazi way. A way to fool you all. This is why you'll never beat us. Never. Never. Oh, oh. <laughs> Toby. Toby. Where are you? Over here. Near the foot of the cliff. Are you all right? That first bullet creased my head. I was already dropping by the time he fired. Outside of that, I'm all right. I figured that was what had happened when Schmidt went down the well. I knew it was an accident. I was pretty happy that it was you that buried me the second time. That you put my face against the cliff, left a hole for me to breathe. The first time, well, it was pretty tough until the wind blew the sand off. Yeah, but... What about when he 
Shot you again. That ungodly music. It wasn't me he shot that second time. It was Schmidt. I pulled his body out of the well. I figured that in the dark, no one would be able to tell the difference. As for the music, that's why I dug the grave here. You see these holes here in that cliff? My people drilled them centuries ago. The wind blows through them. Makes weird music. This bottom hole was blocked up, but I opened it while I was digging the grave. Talking of graves? There's three of them we should be digging right now. Just one more thing I'd like to ask you, Toby. What's that? What you said this morning. Those three buzzards flying together toward the west. Does it really mean three devs? There were three devs. Weren't there, Dad? Never give a Nazi an even break, unless it's in the neck. As for our three visiting murderers, they may not like our sense of humor, but they can't complain about our poetic justice. After all, it was in the desert that they got their just... Deserts? Well, Mary Bennett, did you like the desert with its sand and wind and weird music? Would you like to live there? Well, I wouldn't mind so much. You know, I believe a woman can make a good home in some pretty out-of-the-way places, the way the old-time housewives did. But, well, I'd want to lay in a supply of good modern food, food that's easy to make, like Lipton's noodle soup. <laughs> Say, that noodle soup of Lipton's would really put some cheer in the desert, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, of course, Mary, of course. Remind me to take Lipton's with me on my next safari. <laughs> We must have a word of advice. Here it is. If you should wake up one of these nights in a cold sweat, convinced that there's something or someone in your room, and if when you look toward the window you should see a strange figure silhouetted in the moonlight, then pull the blankets up over your head and don't look out again. It'll be one of our three friends from tonight's story. One of the Africa corpses. By the way, this month's inner sanctum mystery novel is Puzzle for Puppets by Patrick Quentin. Well, now I guess it's time to close that there squeaking door until next week at this same time. So until next Tuesday night. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Folks, here we are outside the squeaking door. And, and I guess we're all pretty thirsty after all that talk about desert. Well, I know just the thing that'll put us back to normal again. It's Lipton tea. Yes, a cup of that brisk Lipton tea would do just fine. And did you notice that word brisk? B-R-I-S-K. It's a mighty important word in tea language. The tea experts always use it. It means that Lipton tea has a lively flavor, never wishy-washy. That's why most folks prefer Lipton's to any other kind. Don't forget, that's Lipton tea. And don't forget to tune in again next Tuesday night to Inner Sanctum. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.